most likely to survive presented by Matt Faulkner. This presentation is sponsored by the Northern New Jersey Traumatic Brain Injury System and Kessler Foundation. Welcome to our quarterly speaker series, Winter Brainstorm. This series is sponsored by Kessler Foundation as part of our TBI Model System Grant, which is funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. It's now my pleasure to introduce Matt Faulkner, who will be presenting today, Most Likely to Survive. Matt is the co-author of the book, Most Likely to Survive, and the subject of the document film Recovery, both of which detail the events surrounding his near-death an unexpected recovery from severe TBI he suffered shortly before his high school graduation. Revived from the brink of death and spending nearly two months in a coma, doctors did not give him a lot of hope for survival or recovery. Fortunately, Matt took part in an intensive neurorehabilitation at Erie County Medical Center in Buffalo, New York. He beat the odds by walking out of the hospital on his own two feet after 103 days and across the stage at his high school graduation two weeks later. He went on to graduate with a bachelor's degree in economics and finance from Cassinius College less than four years after that. Today, he is happily married to his husband, Kyle. He still lives near Buffalo and works for NRG Energy. Outside of his full-time job, He's a seasoned guest speaker on the topic of TBI rehabilitation, adaptability and recovery to groups of students, nurses, and therapists. Matt hopes to use his experience to demonstrate the wonder of neuroplasticity, as well as positively impact the current paradigm of neurorehabilitation so that it focuses more on individual patients. Thank you, Matt, for being here with us today. Good afternoon, Jamie. Thank you for the great introduction. Um, can you start off the slide deck as well? Thanks. Well, it is quite an honor to be invited by the Kessler Foundation to speak at this event for the Traumatic Brain Injury TBI community. I have followed the Kessler Foundation for a number of years now, and I absolutely love the work that they are doing to help people with different different abilities of all kinds, including those resulting from TBI. I am frequently asked to and have participated in their research studies, and someday soon I hope to make a road trip to New Jersey to fully engage and get a functional MRI for their research. So again, it's great to be here, and I hope to share my experience today to show how we need resource organizations like this to advocate for better support for those with TBI, both in a sense of rehabilitation and ability awareness, but also in the broader sense of rehabilitation and adaptability. My story shares how without the help of others, I wouldn't have survived. Without the help of the people who were there for me when I needed the most help, I could not have chosen to recover and rebuild my life. Critically, I hope to serve this community as both a TBI survivor and as an ally to caregivers. So my story begins, it was March of my senior year of high school. I had just turned 18 years old. I had a car and I drove myself to school where I was the editor in chief of the yearbook and on the board of the school's National Honor Society chapter. On the weekends, I worked at Old Navy. Not sure where I found the time, but I even went on dates once in a while. Life was pretty good. Not long before, I was voted most likely to succeed by my classmates, and this fueled my ego. But I was ready to finish my AP courses, take the exams, hopefully find a prom date, finally graduate, and move on to new things, like attending Canisius College where I would be studying finance. I was also looking forward to living on campus with my peers in the All College Honors Program. You might say that I was ready to begin the next segment of my life. Although my life 
took a dramatically different turn after school one day. So I was ready for the next thing, but the next thing I knew, I woke up in what felt like a nightmare where I couldn't speak and everyone was lying to me, including my mom and dad. They and others whom I had never met before were telling me that I had been in a car accident and that I had had a traumatic brain injury. I remember thinking, this isn't true. I don't remember that. I felt like I had to escape from this place. I had to wake up. And when the opportunity presented itself, I went for it. I had to run from this. But when I tried to get out of bed and run away, my legs crumbled beneath the weight of my body and I quickly fell to the floor. That moment on the cold hospital floor, that's the moment that I tell people that I remember waking up from the coma. I woke up to the reality that my legs and my body didn't work like they used to. I also woke up to the truth that it was now May and that months had gone by since my last solid memory. I learned that I had spent over six weeks in a coma before I began following simple commands, but I didn't have a real sense of what was going on until that moment, just over two months since my accident. Although I don't remember it, I later learned that I was on an innocent trip with some friends after school one day when things changed. On our way back home, my friend who was driving made a left turn when she probably shouldn't have, and a pickup truck collided with her compact sedan right where I was sitting in the back seat of her car. After the pickup truck hit us at around 40 miles per hour, I fell into a deeply unconscious state. I was in cardiac arrest, so my heart had stopped beating, and I also wasn't breathing. Apart from some cuts, my body was fine, but my brain was not. Luckily, the first responders arrived very quickly and noted my poor condition. They saw that I was in a state of abnormal posturing known as decerebrate. This was not a good sign, but the EMS workers, most of whom, whom were volunteer firefighters, gave me a shot of epinephrine to jumpstart my heart, and they also intubated me. They recognized that I needed to get to the ICU quickly, so I was flown by EMS helicopter, known as Mercy Flight, to Erie County Medical Center in Buffalo, New York. Fortunately, no one else was hurt in the accident, and all of my friends had walked away. But it didn't appear likely that I would survive, let alone attend college, or return to a functionally independent life. At the hospital, an initial CT scan revealed multiple injuries to my brain, including intracranial hemorrhages, intraparenchymal contusions in the regions of the hippocampus and the basal ganglia on the right, with blood in the occipital horns on the lateral ventricle, as well as petechial hemorrhages in the frontal lobes bilaterally and near the pons. That's about as technical as I'll get for this whole presentation, but I wanted to include that. A neurosurgeon performed an emergency ventriculostomy to relieve the buildup of pressure inside my skull from the bleeding and the swelling and to hopefully stop further damage. I don't remember anything from that last day without a damaged brain. My plans were shot. My new focus was a far reach from anything that I had ever expected. When I woke up and became aware of these things, I had no other choice but to accept what had happened and that it was going to be a lot more challenging for me to accomplish what I had planned for myself. As hard as I tried, I couldn't speak, I couldn't walk or maneuver a wheelchair, and I definitely couldn't even feed myself. College was a long shot, but my immediate goal was to relearn to walk again so that I could cross the stage at my high school graduation in less than two months. I struggled to relearn all the normal things that I once did while my friends, including everyone in the car that day, 
were experiencing the last days of high school and going to prom. But I didn't focus on that. I couldn't focus on that. What I did focus on was doing what I had to do in order to return to some degree of normalcy. I wanted to recover. I had to be engaged in working with my therapists who were there for me and wanted me to recover. I had once been an honor student with a car and a part-time job, but this was my new life and I took therapy seriously. I was fortunate to be offered a new full-time job. This job was physical, occupational, and speech therapies, each of them five days a week. But I did what I had to do I developed great relationships with the great people who were at the hospital and wanted to help me recover. I was also lucky to have both of my mom and my dad there with me every single day, in addition to other family and friends who would visit me often. By Mother's Day that year, my voice suddenly returned and I was able to wish my mom a happy Mother's Day with just a whisper. I probably will never be able to top that gift. Very slowly, I relearned my activities of daily living and to do all the important things again. If you've ever heard of neuroplasticity, please know that it is a real thing and I hope to be a case study of it. After months of intensive rehabilitation and 103 days in the hospital, I walked out of the hospital on my own two feet. Then 12 days later, I walked out of the hospital, or then 12 days later, I walked across the stage at my high school graduation to receive my high school diploma. Day by day, I adjusted to my new life, relearning how to function again with many challenges along the way. It was difficult adjusting to doing things for myself again, but I had to try. I continued outpatient speech, physical therapy, and occupational therapies for a few months, but my insurance would no longer cover me after I was deemed functional, although I'm far from where I am today, although I was far from where I am today. Eight months after the accident, I started back at my part-time job at Old Navy, where I handled customer service and transactions. Working as a cashier now with a traumatic brain injury was a very different experience than I had before. And I even had a rude customer ask me bluntly, what's wrong with you? After I was really struggling to fold her clothes and get them into a bag, I told her exactly what was wrong with me. Despite my shortcomings with folding clothes, I wasted no time and started college slowly that fall with just two courses at Erie Community College. While Canisius College held my scholarship and admission until I was ready. This was a great opportunity for me to figure out how college courses would be as a freshman, but also with a different and damaged brain. Before the end of my first semester in college, I went to a neuropsychologist for a neuropsych evaluation. This doctor reviewed my medical records, but was not very positive in his outlook, telling me that I would not be able to graduate from college without significant accommodations, nor would I be able to join the competitive workforce. All of that before I even sat for testing. I reviewed his results a week later, or I received his results a week later, accompanied with a letter that concluded with a statement which I will never forget. Patient is a well-intentioned, determined young man who may not respond adaptively to negative feedback about his neuropsychological status. I would need to go back to him for further discussion and reviewing of my results because it was all psychometric data that I was not familiar with. But I decided to find another neuropsychologist after I received an A- in both of the courses that I had taken that first semester. 
It was clear to me then that I was responding adaptively to all of the negative feedback. I went to another neuropsychologist before the end of my second semester at Erie Community College. She took a different approach by focusing on my intended major, which was finance. She reviewed the results of my testing and explained to me that the testing showed that I was actually unlikely to have difficulties studying finance because my biggest areas of deficit were visual spatial organization and quite shockingly, motor skills. But I was very thankful that she was not going to make me take the pegboard test again, one where you put the little pegs in the in like in little holes and you have to do it with each your uh, dominant and non-dominant hand. I did horribly at that. She taught me a small adaptation for the visual spatial processing problem. And this is something that I have greatly benefited from to this day. She retested me in a few key areas related to what I would be studying. And ultimately it was determined that I would not need any academic accommodations to start school full time. I might not be great at folding clothes, but I couldn't be happier. Shortly after that, I was evaluated by an occupational therapist and approved to drive a car again. By fall of 2010, I was ready to move into the dorms at Canisius College like I had originally planned, just one year off schedule. And by 2013, after three years at Canisius College, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in economics with about a 3.5 GPA. Many people used to say to me that you only have one year to make the most of your recovery. And all this gave me was fear. Looking back, I don't believe this is even remotely true. My brain injury was almost 14 years ago and I continued to, and I'm continuing to recover living a life that I could have only dreamed of when I awoke from the coma. My philosophy remains that your brain thrives off of new experiences and that it doesn't stop adapting throughout your life, even after brain injury. My life was well planned out before I had a TBI, but as things changed, I had to learn to reassess those plans I did not spend much time focusing on how or why this happened to me. Instead, I focused on what I wanted to get out of my recovery. In 2009, what primarily motivated me was being able to go to my high school graduation and walk across that stage. Then I moved on to the next thing. After that, I focused on using the skills that I had retained like my ability to learn new things and to use a computer to research ways that I could make the most out of my current situation so that I could begin college and eventually get my dream job, which was really just working in a corporate business office. Today, I'm proud to say that I am working in my dream job. I work full time in regulatory compliance for NRG Energy. I'm also married, and my husband and I are building a family of our own. I drive myself places, and I live pretty independently. I even make the coffee and do most of the laundry at home. I still have difficulty with a lot of motor skills, like speaking normally, moving around quickly, and working with my hands. Lucky for me, cooking and snow blowing are best handled by my husband. The brain injury also left me with central pain syn syndrome, which manifests in my left foot and is really annoying because it only hurts when I think about it. And there's nothing I can do except think less about it. And guess what? It hurts right now just because I'm thinking about it. While I sometimes struggle to get dressed and tie my shoes, I am truly grateful that I don't have any issues with my executive functioning or with language and that I am able to live a mostly normal and productive life. 
I hope to have an impact on my community by sharing my experience as a past patient to help future clinicians develop a passion for individualized treatment. Outside of my full-time job, I work in the community by speaking to high school students about motivation and adaptability. I also speak to graduate and undergraduate college students in medicine and rehabilitation science, as well as professional therapists about my experiences as a patient recovering from TBI. I've spoken to the Doctorate of Physical Therapy students at the University of Buffalo for going on 10 years now. And it remains the highlight of my year. Every year, the students in the class are so focused on learning to and learning from my perspective after they spend a semester learning about neurological disorders and hearing some really grim statistics. I encourage them to focus on the patient's individual goals to help them assess a way to achieve what they want. I believe an individualized approach eases the burden the, eases the burden of statistical prognoses. And I remind students that, I, that a recovery begins when a, with a patient's willingness to recover, and it ends with a patient's goals being realized. Their job as therapists is to develop a plan to help a patient get there. TBI survivors deserve to be treated like a person like the person they were before their injury. This is my best advice for people caring for those who have suffered from a TBI. I love to share my experience with brain injury rehabilitation and recovery with others. I don't want people to be discouraged by that old adage that all the recovery only happens during a one year critical period after brain injury. I feared the truth of this, this. I feared the truth of this statement. But looking back, I think that I have continued to recover well beyond this. I believe I still see a small improvement each and every day. Obviously, these opportunities to speak and share my experience were not in my life plan 14 years ago, but I adapted my plans to use my experiences to serve others in the community who might benefit from my story. All plans are likely to change, so make it a priority to adapt to those changes. There are so many opportunities today to challenge yourself with new perspectives or to grow your skills. And so long as you trust your instincts and remain adaptive, you will always be ready to take the next opportunity my best advice for those recovering from TBI is to accept what has happened and don't be afraid to ask others for help in your own way. Choose an adaptive response to your goals. Communicate to others what your goals are and work with others on ways that you might be able to achieve them. You might be surprised at the willingness of others, people to help you when you just ask. There are so many resources that you can use to learn about yourself and your strengths. Remember that your brain can always change and rewire itself to adapt to your goals. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Matt. It was really inspiring to hear your story and get to learn a bit more about your journey. Um, at this time, we'd like to open things up to everyone for questions. As a neuropsychologist, I was a, a bit disappointed to hear uh, your first experience getting that feedback that um, sounded a bit dim. Um, thankfully, as a field for brain injury, we've moved beyond that heuristic of uh, in the first year is really where you expect most of the recovery. We now think of brain injury as more of a chronic case. So a lot has changed, thankfully, in the last uh, year since your, since your injury. But in that moment, kind of where did you, where did you find the, the strength, the oomph to kind of keep going when you had that, um, had that response from the, the neuropsychologist? Well, when the 
neuropsychologist, I mean, I was sitting in the room with him and my parents and he like reviewed my my case, like the, the, the grim statistics of my case. And he just, he just said like, you know, you want to go to college and you, but you're probably not going to be able to without significant accommodations because of this happening to you. And you also probably won't be able to find a job in the competitive oh. workforce. And, you know, that really hurt me. And, and that was before I did the testing with uh, his technician. Uh -huh. So he, he wasn't even able to see how I performed on that uh -huh. until he reviewed the results afterward. And then the, le the letter about those results, now I understand that, you know, so I was below normal on a lot of different things, but I was also above normal on a few different skills. And, you know, just getting those results back, I wasn't able to understand at the time what the meanings of the, of the testing that was done you know, what it meant, but I had that letter with all of the negative and then also that last statement, but it, it really motivated me because I, I had to, you know, prove people wrong, I felt, okay. and I felt that I had already done that up to that point, but it was clear to me that I had, I still had people that I was going to have to really prove wrong about traumatic brain injury and, and my experience with it. So I, you know, and like I said, I, you know, was just finishing my first semester in school without any academic accommodations. Uh -huh. I did pretty well in those classes. Um, and then when I, I, but I mean, I still didn't understand the results of the testing until I went to that second neuropsychologist. But, you know, it was really great that she had took a different approach to it. Uh -huh. And, you know, maybe if I had gone to her first, maybe she would have said similar things and given me a full, like a full evaluation like he had, you know. But there's no need for me to take the pegboard test more than once. <laughs> we know that I can't put little pins in a, in a board. <laughs> Fully agree. That one could be quite frustrating. And, uh, yeah, your description makes a ton of sense. <laughs> okay, and I see we have a question from Jim Grady. So you said, Matt, that um, the brain will improve. How? Um, this person saying that they, they're just trying to return to normal. So my answer to that is, you know, the, the brain, you know, with the damage to the brain, there are areas that will never heal. But I believe that if you, you focus on what you want to do and you work with others on ways of adapting to your goal, your brain really has a lot of opportunity to rewire itself in order to allow you to accomplish things easier with practice. It takes a lot of practice. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I have a lot of difficulty speaking um, when it's not prepared. And I don't want to tell you how many times I've practiced this speech before. But yeah, it's just, it takes practice and a lot of patience to, to uh, figure out the best way to do things, to, to be able to adapt how you do something in order to make it easier and more efficient for yourself. Okay. You know, and, and that can involve, it can always involve help from other people. There's no shame in that. Um, I found a lot of uh, great resources online, learning about, uh, you know, different things, my, my skills, the way my brain works, things like that. So it was, it was very easy for me to, to, you know, get on the computer. I did this even when I was in the hospital. I used a computer and I went on Wikipedia and I started reading up about all the things that they were telling me because I was interested in learning the best way to, to, you know, understand myself and how it, it would be, um, feasible for me to achieve what I wanted. And some of my goals have changed. I'm not going to lie, but 
you know, I was fortunate that you know, the things that I wanted to achieve, I was still able to, but in a different way, obviously. Okay. Yeah, and as you mentioned, um, as that second neuropsychologist was able to help you learn a bit where where you had some weaknesses that needed to be addressed, but where your strengths were, and then being able to work with your strengths to address those weaknesses. Yeah, she, you know, she started off by telling me, "Well, you have great listening. You have great um, auditory processing, like." your auditory processing is definitely above average. And that's a skill that you can utilize to help you achieve your goals, you know. Now with the visual spatial organization, processing, memory type uh, deficits that I had, I really believe that that was something that I always had to some slight degree because I was never really one to enjoy artistic things or, you know, artistic depictions of things. Mm -hmm. But the neuropsychologist that I went to on the, at that second time, she told me that I could, uh, there'd be a good way for me to work around this by using my other skills like being able to put things into you know, words and think about things as verbal descriptions in order to remember mm -hmm. what something looks like. And that's, that's how I do it probably without even thinking about it to this day. You know, if, if I see something and I really don't think about what it looks like, I'm not going to remember it. But if I, if I see something and I want to remember it, I actively think about what it looks like in words in order to remember it. And, and that's really benefited me a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I definitely hear what you're saying, Matt. Um, that's great. Thanks for kind of sharing that, those thoughts on, on kind of adaptation and, and, um, and neural flexibility. Um, Peter, I saw you had your hand raised earlier. Do you still have a question? Yeah, I had put, it into the chat to uh, Ms. Langenfelder. I didn't know if she wanted to like curate the thing, but I can discuss what I wanted to ask now. Yeah, you, you can go ahead and, and ask it yourself, Peter. All right, well, um, I, I sustained a TBI going on nine years ago, and mine wasn't nearly as catastrophic as yours was. was closed head injury, um, you know, and I had a, a short period of time where yeah, walking was out of the question, and you know, I, I had a similar uh, a similar series of episodes like you reported in the hospital, wanting to get out of bed and instantly falling into a yard sale on the hospital floor. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I had some uh, menial jobs and not much. Uh, uh, not much fulfillment in uh, employment, uh, especially after what I used to do before the accident. So anyway, I decided to go back to school and, and try to get a master of social work at Seton Hall. And my question was about uh, some current ideas on academic accommodations. I didn't have physical things, but um, uh, for example, the, the memory processing issues I had, you know, what can they do for exams? I mean, giving me extra time, that wasn't going to help. And, you know, I, I got decent grades based on the strength of my writing when I had plenty of time to, uh, to work on that. But what kinds of things uh, did uh, they offer you at Canisius uh, and are what are available now? So first off, Peter, I'm you know, glad to hear that you recovered so well and that you were able to get your master's degree and sort of adapt what you were doing in response to your brain injury. Uh, at Canisius College, they are able to offer, I'm, I'm sure at all colleges too, they're able to offer a lot of 
adaptations like somebody to read the questions to you on an exam to somebody to um yeah just getting more time on tests but like you said that was not helpful to you um because of your memory issues i think with memory there are other adaptations that can be helpful that a neuropsychologist could help you with um, through different strategies for remembering things. Um, that wasn't something that I uh, generally had difficulty with besides the like visual memory. Um, and I, I uh, was, it was determined that I did not need any academic accommodations while I was at Canisius. So I was pretty much on my own to discover you know, how I learn best and what worked for me best. And uh, you mentioned that you were, you had uh, satisfactory writing skills, at least. Mm -hmm. And for me, with remembering a lot of information, I feel that it's best to write it out in a summary. I'm not sure if that is helpful to you because of your ability to write. But that would be something that I would, I would expect to be helpful. I'm not sure if Erica has anything to add for accommodations in that light. Yeah, I, I think you, you covered it well of, you know, there's some things that the, um, that the school could do to kind of shape how you're taking the test, but I really would rely on someone who does say cognitive rehabilitation to give you some memory strategies. Um, I don't know that the school itself, but, but also I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, um, but it, it's a great question and definitely one that needs some exploration. All right, I see we have two hands raised, but I do wanna to get to, there's a question in the chat. Um, from Kathy. She says, before your TBI, did you have a stubborn streak or would you characterize yourself as determined? So I think she's uh, basically indicating, you know, or says this is my experience prior to TBI and I feel like it helped me with my recovery. So was that kind of always your personality or did things kind of switch a bit? Um, stubbornness, I'm, I'm sure I could be could be thought of as stubborn at times. I did have a, I always had a real determination and a focus on goals that I wanted to achieve, and especially with school. You know, I was always very focused in school on doing well. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, that, so that was, uh, t to me, that was definitely you know, uh, a catalyst to my, um, my need to sort of prove the system, the system with traumatic brain injury recovery as, you know, not, not uh, likely to have an effect on my case because I, you know, I was, fortunate to have been given such intensive neuro rehabilitation. I was very fortunate too that, you know, I had goals that were manageable with, with my physical disability that I have. You know, it, it did not hurt me that I was not going to be able to play uh, basketball or whatever on the court with, because I was never an athlete. I skipped gym class sometimes in high school actually. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so definitely stubbornness i might also rephrase it as determined determination Deter yeah so i was always a very determined individual and that was my personality i did not want to let this um hurt what i wanted for myself I was, again, I was very fortunate to have so many other people that wanted to help me, who were there for me too. You know, it was great. My, my mom was there with me in the hospital every single day. And my dad slept over with me in the, in the hospital room every night. 
Uh, so wow. you know, it's great to have that support. And they're both listening. And I love <laughs> you, mom and dad, for what you've done. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I think you 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 hit the nail on the head. It does. It takes a lot of social support around you to be able to to find that strength. But there's that piece that you know comes from from your own personality and your own uh, interest in in driving your goals forward. Mm-hmm. Um, just before we get to the two hands raise, um, uh, we have an expert uh, person on our uh, staff. We just wanted uh, to mention. Um, with regard to the academic accommodations question previously, um, students should always contact the school's Office of Disability Services for accommodations and ideas on the supports that they could have at their at their school and at their program if they're dealing with any sort of disability. Okay, um, so next let's go to Wendy. Wendy, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, can I, can I talk like this? Is this okay? Yeah, you're great. I just wanted to, um, one of the things we had gone through uh, similar situations as, and so one of the things that I thought was a very informative and can help the, the uh, master's degree guy, um, that one of his limitations was a visual memories and his word was a good thing. So he associated the visual memories with word. So if the gentleman could do, you know, find whatever his strengths are and associate his memory weaknesses with that, then he could change it to possibly help him. I don't know. Yeah. And, and just said, I very much enjoyed the presentation and very pre- appreciative of that. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. All right, and next I see Leanne. Hi. Um, thank you also for your presentation. Um, I had an acquired brain injury about nine years ago. Hi, Peter. Um, And um, I I have had one of, I, I, until pretty recently, and I'm about to turn 65, um, I constantly felt improvement. And now I don't know if it's age, I don't know what's going on exactly. But what I'm wondering about is um, if you had, anxiety or depression that you had to struggle with because for me I think that's been the most disabling thing because it makes my symptoms worse um and I'm just wondering if you have any tips on how to handle that if that's something that you struggled with yes absolutely I'm sorry to hear about that Leanne um anxiety and depression are definitely a big thing for a lot of people that hold them back from whatever they want to achieve. I personally was always a very anxious person. So I had a lot of anxiety and this definitely increased the level of anxiety that I had uh, in certain social situations. And I had a lot of anxiety, mostly about being able to, to achieve what I wanted, you know, what I had planned for myself before my injury. I, you know, my biggest anxiety still to this day is um, how much can I contribute? I, I, I want to contribute, you know, as a person. That's my main goal, my main focus, my main driver. But, you know, worrying about it is not helpful at all. And in regards to uh, prescription medication support. While I was in college and for a few years after, I took Lexapro and that really, really helped with my anxiety a lot. And I, th- I think that, you know, I don't take anything now. I feel that my anxieties are a lot more manageable. You know, and a lot of it is through mindfulness to acceptance and commitment therapy, things like that. Those have been very, very helpful, you know. So maybe in combination with the medication supports, or even just in combination with a good counselor or a good book. You know, a good book was all I really needed to to really help with um, my anxieties after I stopped the medication. 
What was the therapy that you mentioned that was helpful? Uh, it's known as acceptance and commitment therapy. It's uh, an acronym ACT, A-C-T. And that, that's been around for a long time. And a lot of, a lot of therapists are very familiar with that, that um, methodology. But the, one of the best books that I ever read was The Happiness Trap. And that is written by someone who is one of the developers of uh, ACT Act. Um, and that book really helped me see things a lot differently. You know, and, and not everyone is going to get as much as they will from a, one book or any book. But that book in particular really helped me, helped me, helped me focus on what I needed to do next and to not worry about anything else but i mean that was the book i was book i didn't read until i was 30 so mm -hmm. yeah that's great i i have an occupier i oh sorry um behavioral therapy cognitive behavioral therapist which is who has been extremely helpful um but i was just wondering if there are other options so thank you very much and thanks for the presentation you're very welcome. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, that's a that's a great question and something that we, of course, need to really talk openly about. It's very common to have anxiety and depression after a brain injury, and a lot of people had some anxiety and depression before their brain injury, so it may be pre-existing. But as both Leanne and Matt were sharing, there are a lot of great treatments out there, and I'm glad you, you brought up um, acceptance and commitment therapy. It is um, a very helpful in terms and very evidence-based in terms of helping someone think about living with their living in service of their values, even if maybe the way that you're doing those things may look a little different than what you're used to. But cognitive behavioral therapy is also um, kind of a, a, one of the most established in our field. So it mm -hmm. sounds like there's a lot of great options out there. Um, could you put the name of that book in the chat, please? Ah, yes, I can do that. So that was the happiness trap. Yep. So I have a comment um, that Gina, uh, Gina Marie made to me in the chat, and it was about difficulty she had keeping um, her job because of difficulty from the coworkers um, and customers. And, you know, I know you talked about at Old Navy, the difficulty you had putting the shirt in the bag and how you responded to the to the customer. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about what what you do when you get um, you know resistance from people at work, or you know um, some ways that you might um, have to sort of get over people's uh, you know whether they're talk to you directly about it or you know any kind of comments they might make to you or yeah so. And it's something I struggle with very often. Um, I feel that because of the, my um, the prosody, like the rhythm of my speech, I feel that you know it's it's different from the way that most people would speak, especially you know in their thirties. And I find that people are sometimes very like taken aback by that. And I, I feel that I have to, I feel that it's my, my um, responsibility then to, you know, tell them, you know, oh, sorry, like I had, you know, a traumatic brain injury. So it, you know, affects the way that I move and the way that I speak a little bit. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm very able to do a lot of things, but I feel like I have to get past that with a lot of people before I can, you know, establish a true connection with them or to allow them to hear what I, hear me and see me for what I'm saying. So at, at work when I, you know, all the people at work know me not by now. I've been working there for almost 11 years. So I, I don't have, I don't encounter too much of that in my job. And that's also because I, I'm able to demonstrate that I, you know, have done good work for the business and 
you know, I have that to sort of fall back on. But yeah, when I when I am introduced to new people or when I you know have to communicate with random people, I always that's one of like my biggest social anxieties is that I'm I am a little bit different than the way you know normal people would be and I I feel that I have to compensate for that and that uh, increases sort of the burden on me and my anxieties because then I'm always like okay now I need to make sure that I'm using elevated language in order to show this person that I'm not you know intellectually disabled or something like that because I feel that at times I could look or sound like I have some sort of intellectual disability because I have dysarthria. Yeah. Um, one other, I don't see any other questions yet, but I, I did have a question. You had mentioned about goals a few times in your talk uh, and about setting them and kind of, you know, changing them. Um, do, you, do you have any suggestions for people who are, you know, maybe having difficulty, uh, you know, achieve their goals or difficulty in trying to figure out what goals might be reasonable for them or um, maybe how people might have to adapt their goals? Yeah, so for me, my goal was, my goal was really just to go to college. Well, first it was just to walk across the stage of my high school graduation, but then physically that was really all I needed to accomplish physically. Um, I didn't want to be able to, you know, play a sport again or anything like that. Um, but then my goal was just to be able to go to college like I had planned and do well in school like I had planned. And you know, I, I adapted a lot of how I study and how I, how I deliver certain types of work, you know, in, I'm not sure if this is probably, and it's probably uh, something that a lot of people encounter, but in high school, I did not study at all. And I was able to graduate with a 95 GPA. And I, that was all just through participating in class. And I really didn't study at all. But then when I got to college, you know, I, I start, you start to have to study because there's just so much more reading and outside of class work that you need to do. So, and that, you know, that might've been something that everyone was going to encounter, especially if they were like me and they didn't study at all in high school. But, you know, I had to figure out what's the best way to consume the most knowledge that I could in order to best prepare for these uh, exams. And part of that involved me not really socializing as much as I could have or should have maybe. I didn't make a lot of friends in, in college. Um, I, you know, I had a lot of acquaintances, but the social side of things was always a little bit more of an anxiety for me too. So I really, I remained close to people that I went to high school with who then also attended the same college that I did. And, and that was helpful then getting into social situations with them, you know, bringing me to those things. I see Wendy's hand up. Do you have a, another question, Wendy, or is that still from before? No, I do have another question, if that's oh. all right. Sure. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm so sorry, just take a moment just to get myself together. I'm sorry. Um, so um, one of the questions that I have is with the doctor that had misdiagnosed him, um, I have many doctors. He, I, you know, I, I had three broken hips and, and all that, like, like there was a, a lot wrong with the way that I walk, but I could take a few steps. So what doctors would say, okay, walk for me. And then I take a few steps and they would put that I walk normal. I have severe, I feel what it's called when you fall over, I have that severe and, and then I don't walk right. And my, my question is, so doctors completely misdiagnose and that 
greatly upsets me to see that and hear that continuously. Is there anything that can be done? And did you ever go back to the doctor that misdiagnosed you and say, hey, and wake him up to a situation of misdiagnosis? I mean, there's always a, I always want to do that, but I don't know how to do that very nicely. So, so I, I have emailed the neuropsychologist that I, um, that gave me that poor prognosis. I have emailed him about my progress years ago, but that's more just for, for me to, to say, oh, hey, you told me this, but, but I don't even say that. I just say, Hey, I was your patient. I want to let you know that I, you know, had a severe traumatic brain injury when I was 18, but I'm now doing this. And he might not even remember anything about me, or even like, oh, he want when I, I, what I want him to do is say, oh, who is this? Let me look back at the the letter that I sent him. But who knows if he will? Oh, that's good that you did email and, and hopefully educate him. That's that's my worry is that these doctors that completely misdiagnosed that they're not aware and they're passing on that misinformation. Right, right. And it's very impactful for, to a lot of patients. And I'm sure that it holds a lot of people back from being able to recover as well as yes. they could. I, I, I completely agree. <laughs> Well, we're at the end of our time today, um, but we want to thank you, Matt, for a wonderful presentation today. And we want to thank all of you for attending this presentation. Um, immediately after this presentation, there's going to be a survey that's going to pop up for you to answer about the presentation. And if you don't have time to fill it out today, um, you'll be followed up with an email uh, if you're unable to complete it. Um, some of you have asked about um, being able to access the recorded version of this, and that will be available on the Kessler Foundation um, website. Also be on the new lookout for our new um, spring edition of our newsletter, TBI News and Views. Um, and we hope that you can join us in the spring. Uh, we're going to be holding uh, our spring brainstorm sometime in March with the Brain Injury Alliance of New Jersey's Mike at the Mic. Um, and if you're interested in any more of our events or participating in our research, much of which can be done remotely, please check us out on the Kessler Foundation website. So thank you all for joining us today. And again, thank you, Matt, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I really, it was really a pleasure to participate in this. Join a study at KesslerFoundation.org forward slash join.